Hello everyone, in this video we are going to revisit the problem of finding the minimum speed required for a particle to perform a full loop around some kind of track. Uh, this time though the loop is not going to be circular, it's going to be elliptical instead as you see in this diagram. So I've aligned my ellipse so that the major axis is horizontal and I've marked on my semi-major axis A, it's going to be one of the parameters that defines our ellipse. The other parameter that defines the ellipse is the eccentricity E. Now if you're not familiar with ellipses, then the eccentricity is a parameter that goes from 0 to 1, which tells you basically how non-circular your ellipse is. So if E is 0, then you have a circle, and as E gets closer and closer to 1, you can imagine squashing your circle up more and more and making it more non-circular. Towards the end of the video, we will briefly consider what happens if your ellipse's major axis is vertical instead of horizontal, but let's focus on the horizontal case in the first instance. I'll also be assuming that you've either watched my previous video on the circular loop-de-loop -loop, or that you already know how to solve that problem because there are certain details that I might not explain in as much detail as I did in that previous video. So let's get straight into solving the problem and as we did in the circular case we are going to consider the state of the particle when it's just reached the top of the loop. When it's done that, provided it gets there at all, it's going to have some velocity to the left which I'm going to call v and let's also draw on the forces that are acting on it there is going to be a weight as always pulling it down and in general there can be a normal contact force between the particle and the track as well so let's call our weight mg and our normal contact force n it's also going to be helpful for me to define an additional parameter of the ellipse our final solution is not going to depend directly on this parameter but it's going to make the working a little bit easier so I'm just going to draw a vertical line from the center of the ellipse directly up vertically to the highest point on the ellipse. That is called the semi-minor axis of the ellipse as opposed to the semi-major axis A, and we usually give it the symbol B, so let me just label that there. So the first thing that we did in the circular case was consider conservation of energy to see how V is related to U, so let's do that. Um, at the bottom there is a half mu squared worth of kinetic energy. We take that to be the zero of gravitational potential energy, at the top, you've got a half mv squared of kinetic energy, but you've also got mg times twice the semi-minor axis, so the vertical height from the top to the bottom, um, which is 2b. That's your GPE, and then you rearrange that to get v squared. In terms of u squared, you get v squared is u squared minus 4g times b. So now we consider the resultant force on the particle. So we're going to consider the forces at the top of the loop. So here is where it starts to, to differ significantly from the circular case because it's not moving in a circle, it's moving in an ellipse. However, at any given point in the elliptical motion of our particle, you can approximate its path as a circle and the circle that it's moving in instantaneously will have some particular radius. We call that the radius of curvature. It's basically the radius of the circle that best approximates the ellipse at any particular point. So we can imagine it instantaneously moving in a circle with some radius r. I'm going to write my centripetal force mv squared over r. We don't know what that is yet. I'll tell you in a few moments. But that's just the radius of curvature of the ellipse at the top of the ellipse. Um, and that has to be equal to the resultant force uh, pointing down towards the center of that sort of best approximating circle. The resultant force is mg plus n. And then we do this thing of saying that if it just barely makes it to the top, then the normal contact force will become zero just as it reaches the top. Um, and that gives you the condition v squared is equal to gr because the m's cancel when n is zero. So at this point, I'm just going to quote a result about ellipses that we're going to need, which is at the top of the ellipse, so at the top, the radius of curvature r is given by a squared over b where a is the semi-major axis and b is the semi-minor axis. If you're interested in where that comes from I suggest just consulting Wikipedia's page about radius of curvature and you can look up the formula that you need uh, to work out the radius of curvature of any curve and you can do that for an ellipse. It turns out to have this very nice form a squared over b um, at that top point of the ellipse. Roughly speaking note that that is a big number because a is bigger than b, and so you've got a bigger number on the top and a smaller number on the bottom. That makes sense from the diagram. You can kind of see that the curvature 
is smallest at the top, right? So it's the, the ellipse itself is least strongly curved at the top, which means the circle that best approximates the ellipse at the top is going to be pretty big and it's going to have a large radius of curvature. So let's put all of these equations together and see what happens. We have two different expressions for b squared. We've got u squared minus 4gb. We've also got gr, so we can equate those things together. But we also know that r is a squared over b at the point that we are interested in. So we can write g times a squared over b is equal to u squared minus 4gb. And since we are ultimately interested in the condition uh, on the speed that is required to reach the top and therefore complete, complete the full loop, uh, we get u squared on its own, um, which is just g a squared over b um, plus 4gb. I am then going to factor out uh, a factor of g over b as follows. So u squared is g over b times a squared. Uh, then you're going to get plus 4b squared because there is already a b there and we factor out 1 over b. So now that has to become a b squared. Now, because b was not one of the parameters that I gave at the very beginning, we want to eliminate the b from this expression and write it in terms of a and the eccentricity e. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to have to quote another standard property of ellipses, which is that b squared is equal to a squared times 1 minus e squared. Right? This is true for any ellipse. It's a relationship between the semi-major axis, semi-minor axis, and the eccentricity. And if you just expand those brackets, you get a squared minus a squared e squared. So what happens when you substitute that into your expression for u squared? Well, you've got 4b squared there. That's the same as 4a squared minus 4a squared e squared. So in total, you're going to have 5a squared minus 4a squared e squared. Then we can factor out the a squared and write that as g a squared over b times 5 minus 4e squared. Um, then what I'm going to do to completely eliminate that b is write this as ga times a over b times your bracketed term 5 minus 4e squared. But this a over b thing, you can rewrite using our b squared is a squared times 1 minus e squared. That implies that a is b over the square root of 1 minus e squared. Right? So a over b um, is just 1 over the square root of 1 minus e squared. So this can be written 1 over root of 1 minus e squared. We don't have to bother with plus or minuses or anything when we take the square root because b and a both have to be positive anyway. Um, and then we've still got our bracketed term at 5 minus 4e squared. And so we get the condition that we get a full loop provided that your u squared is bigger than that threshold value. u squared is bigger than 5 minus 4e squared over the square root of 1 minus e squared times g a. So I've just made some space to draw some axes um, because I think the best way to get some insight into what this result that we've derived actually means is to sketch the right hand side as a function of eccentricity and see how the minimum speed required um, varies as we squash up our circle to a greater and greater extent. So what I'm going to do is plot on my x-axis the eccentricity e. The y-axis, let's do it as u squared over ga, which is a dimensionless parameter. The first thing to note is that when the eccentricity e goes to zero and we have a circle, then you just get five on the top uh, of your fraction, you get one on the bottom, and so u squared is bigger than 5ga. But when the eccentricity is zero, then a is just the radius of the circle that you have. So u squared is bigger than 5g times the radius. That is consistent with the result that we got a couple of videos back for a particle going around a circle. So I can put some mark on my y-axis where we've got zero eccentricity and the u squared over ga parameter becomes five. Now, as the eccentricity starts to get bigger, then something interesting happens. The top of the fraction, five minus four e squared, is initially decreasing faster than the bottom is decreasing, right? They're both decreasing, the 5 minus 4e squared and the root 1 minus e squared are both decreasing. Um, but because of this 4, which is not present on the bottom, and also because of the square root, the top is initially decreasing quicker than the bottom. So you get a curve which starts fairly flat and sort of decreases a little bit. But then consider what happens when your ellipse becomes very eccentric and the eccentricity goes towards 1. Well, as e approaches 1, the denominator, root of 1 minus e squared, approaches 0, and so you get a vertical asymptote where the 
minimum required velocity becomes infinite. So I've just drawn on there a rough sketch of how the curve actually looks, decreases a little bit to start with, and then um, becomes infinitely big as the eccentricity approaches one. You can prove, I'm not going to attempt to do this here, but you can prove with a little bit of work by differentiating 5 minus 4e squared over one, uh, root 1 minus e squared, that this actually has a minimum point at eccentricity of root 3 over 2 and a u squared over ga value of, um, of 4. So how can we understand what this graph is actually telling us? Well, let me give you my physical interpretation of what this graph is saying. Um, if you consider small eccentricities first, if you go from a circle and you sort of squash it from the top and the bottom, you're flattening out your circle, and therefore you're making it easier for your particle to reach the, the top in the sense that the flatter your circle gets, or the flatter your ellipse gets, uh, the less GPE it needs to gain in order to reach the top, right? So initially, when you increase that eccentricity, because you're flattening your ellipse, you're reducing the amount of GPE that has to be gained, right? That's why the minimum velocity required decreases a little bit to start with, because you're basically flattening your ellipse. So why does the curve suddenly uh, reach a minimum and then turn around and get to very large values? Well, you can get some insight into that by... Um, imagine taking a circle and squashing it up um, to a fairly extreme extent. Let me just draw a sketch of that at the top right here. So you start with your circle. As the eccentricity increases, you're squashing it up more and more like that. By the time you reach very high eccentricities, if you look at how the, how the ellipse looks very close to the top, it's getting closer and closer to just a flat horizontal line. And mathematically, what's going on there is just that the radius of curvature is getting extremely large. Now, because the top of your ellipse is approaching basically a straight line, and remember your particle is trying to, if it's doing a full loop, at some point it's going to reach this vertex on the right, it's going to need to go all the way across and reach that vertex on the left without losing contact. Um, it's going to need to be going extremely fast along that top bit if it's not strongly curved because gravity is pulling it down all the time, remember. If it's if it's trying to get across a line which is basically horizontal, that's going to be impossible to do because gravity is always pulling it down and it can't move in a horizontal line. That's why your minimum required velocity becomes essentially infinite as your ellipse becomes more and more eccentric. So basically you've got these two conflicting effects. You've got um, more eccentricity, meaning less gain in GPE, which means you need less uh, speed at the bottom, but then you have this radius of curvature effect, which means you need more speed at the bottom. Um, and because these effects are working in, in sort of opposite ways for your minimum speed, that's why you end up with this optimum eccentricity of, of root three over two there. So that's quite an interesting result, I think. To finish off the video, let's briefly consider what would happen if instead of horizontal, your major axis was vertical. So we can take a bit of a shortcut here because we've already worked through the horizontal orientation case. I've just adjusted the diagram and kept some of the working that we did before. Now, this working is no longer valid. However, it's very close to what we do need to do. So we're just going to look through the working that we did before step by step and identify what we have to change in order to get to our new result for this different orientation. So what changes with the energy equation to start with? Well, the only difference here is that instead of going up by a distance of 2b, you're going up by a distance of 2a when you move from the bottom to the top of the ellipse. So this b here has to turn into an a. So that's the first difference. This v squared equals gr will still apply, but your radius of curvature is now different. You can see from the diagram that the radius of curvature at the top now is much smaller um, than it was before when we had it in the... Uh, the horizontal orientation. This is another result that I'm not going to derive, but I'm going to tell you that the radius of curvature at that most strongly curved point on the ellipse is instead of a squared over b, it's b squared over a. Right, so it's a nice symmetrical result. Let me change that r to b squared over a. Um, so the, the net effect of what we've done so far is we've basically swapped b and a around. So what we can do is delete all of this working. We don't really need to worry about that go straight to the next line and swap the a's and the b's around, right? So instead of g over b, we're going to get g over a. This a squared becomes b squared, and this 4b squared becomes 4a squared, like that. Now, because we've swapped the a's and the b's around, the following line is no longer going to be valid, so let me delete that. But we can still use this b squared equals a squared times 1 minus e squared. That's always true for an ellipse. So if we substitute 
for um, b squared in terms of a squared, then you're going to get g over a times what? Well, you your b squared is a squared minus a squared e squared. So combined with this 4a squared, you have 5a squared in total, but you also have minus 1a squared e squared. Um, both of those terms are proportional to a squared, so you can factor that out and divide by a, and you come to the final conclusion that you get a full loop if u squared is bigger than just 5 minus e squared times ga. Now this is a much simpler looking expression than we got in the previous case. Now why is that? Well the first thing to notice is that this is monotonically decreasing uh, with x intricity. As the x intricity goes from uh, 0 up to 1, then this pre-factor um, just decreases smoothly from 5 down to 4. So why is the behavior so different this time compared with the horizontal orientation? Well we can again visualize what's happening as we change the x intricity. We start with a circle. If we keep a fixed but increase the eccentricity and a is vertical this time, we're squashing our circle from left to right like this instead. So as we do that, we're not actually changing the height from the bottom to the top, right? It still has to go up a distance of 2a. So this time the eccentricity doesn't affect the amount of gravitational potential energy that needs to be gained in order to reach the top. However, as you squash up your ellipse from left to right, you are changing the radius of curvature at, at the top, but you're changing in the opposite way to what was happening before. This time you're making it more and more strongly curved at the top. In other words, you're reducing the radius of curvature at that maximum point. So intuitively, a small radius of curvature or a strongly curved um, path is going to be guiding your particle more easily along, along that path. Right? It's, still, it's still being pulled down by gravity, but you don't have to be moving quite as fast to make sure that you don't fall down because the track is basically guiding you along that strongly curved path in contrast to what was happening with the horizontal case where the top of your ellipse was basically a straight line that wasn't really guiding your particle along at all. If you prefer a mathematical viewpoint of that, you can just look at this equation, v squared equals gr. Um, and so if r is very small, then the v squared required uh, for that particular radius of curvature is also smaller. So you don't have these two conflicting effects of GPE and radius of curvature this time. The GPE is not changing as E changes, um, but you're making it easier for the particle to get to the top by increasing the eccentricity. So there you have it. We've got our results. We've interpreted them physically. I'll just finish by saying that I am planning to do another video on this same problem of the elliptical loop-the-loop, -loop, but this time using constrained Lagrangian mechanics. So if that sounds interesting, then I hope you'll join me soon for that next video.